Hello, I'm Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts. And first off, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. We're in 2023. Feels great. Uh, starting to activate into the new year. And I have a ton of books to talk about. I have been book drunk during this betwixtmas. I was hoping that I was going to have a nice, relaxing, uh, kind of decadent, luxurious, calm, quiet betwixtmas. Uh, but instead, I was just full throttle. Um, I don't know what happened. I don't know what came over me, but it's been all books all the time. I've been really engaged, really inspired. Uh, so yeah, so you'll see that reflected in what I talk about today. Okay, so let's jump right in because I've got a lot of books to talk about and I don't want this to take forever. So the first thing I want to talk about is, oh, and by the way, I'm referencing my new book journal for this year. Uh, I did a whole little series of it on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram link is below and I put it in a story highlight so that it won't get lost. But uh, okay, in reference, referencing my weekly spread where I talk where I kind of keep track of what's in progress. Okay, the first thing I finished was strangers and at the hairdresser. And that means that our Anita Bruckner project that Leo of Leo's Little Book Life on Instagram that we've done together for over two years is come to an end. It's done. So I actually am going to wrap this video up and I'm going to do a how and why to read Anita Bruckner after. I told you I've got a busy day going. So stay tuned for that. Um, I will, as a preview, tell you that uh, At the Hairdressers is just a short story that was done and it's the last thing she wrote or it was definitely the last thing published. Where, When she wrote it, who knows, but it was the last thing published. And if you're new to Anita Bruckner, it's exceptional. It is, it is fantastic and would be a great entry point if you're interested in her oeuvre and trying to uh, dip your toes in. Okay, so the next books that I finished was a book that I just, I marvel at this author. I don't understand. I, I literally don't understand how she's able to make me feel so much with such a slim amount of words. Um, it's evocative. It's instantly emotional without being sentimental, which I don't, again, I'm not really sure how she does that, but it feels magical. And the book I'm talking about is Foster by Claire Keegan. I was gifted this as a digital arc, uh, so I want to thank the publisher and NetGalley for giving me access to that. And this book is, is phenomenal. So my understanding is that this was first published in The New Yorker and then was just reprinted. Uh, and it's the story of a, a young child, very young, um, and she is asked, she, it, we opened with her and her father going on a trip. And her father is, they, it doesn't seem like they have a great relationship. It's a little estranged. It's a little tenuous, maybe. Uh, and she's a quiet child. She's a timid child. And they go to this, this family's home. It's a couple, the Kinsellas. Kinsellas, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. As they're at the Kinsella's home, it becomes apparent that she's going to be left there, that these people are taking her in and they're taking her in because this family has come on hard times and there are a lot of children and the mother is about to have another one. So there's a new baby coming, imminent any day. And it's just easier to get her out of the out of the home because she's the most, I guess, independent and oldest. And so the Kinsellas have been kind enough to take her in. And it's a whole new world for her. It's a completely different way of living and interacting with other people. Uh, the Kinsellas are constantly in motion. They're active. They're kind. They're thoughtful. But there's something that happened in this home that isn't really talked about that slowly makes itself known through the course of the book. 
And uh, number one, I don't usually like short stories. Uh, so this this end of this December may have changed my mind about that because of the Nina Bruckner short story and then this one. Uh, uh, and I don't like child child narrators or things through children's eyes. I don't like that at all. Uh, I tend to find it a little twee, a little charming and um, affected. Whereas this was so well done. And again, n lacking sentimentality, but real heart. So she's, she's definitely an author that I'm going to want to follow much more closely than I have in the past because this is the second book that I've read from her that I absolutely adore. She also did small things like these, which I read uh, earlier in, in the fall and w it blew my mind. Uh, so yeah, yeah, really, if you haven't read her yet uh, I, I and, and you like those types of of quiet but but powerful writing and really good craftsmanship uh she's phenomenal then uh leo and i had a buddy read so we have been trying to read some of uh, some of the books listed in backlisted the podcast because they do such a great job and they always talk about interesting books and so he and i have compiled a list of the things that that he hasn't read and I haven't read and we'd be interested in exploring. Not, I would say like 80% of what they read are things that we're interested in. And lucky for me, this is a Dutch classic. So I have the Dutch master <laughs> of Leo to kind of guide me through it. And I'm so glad that he did because um, I don't know that I would have continued without, without his insight and knowledge. And the book is The Evenings by Gerard Rev. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous cover. Don't let the cover fool you. The cover and the first paragraph, the first sentences make you think that you're about to, to read like a cozy book. It's set during Betwixt Mists, so around Christmas and New Year's. So the story is we have a young man, Fritz, and he's uh, 22. He acts much younger, uh, very immature, uh, very uh, like he's just a smart ass, um, not very thoughtful at all about anyone else. Has a lot of psychological tics that manifest themselves in relationship to other people. Uh, example is he cannot handle if there is quiet in a conversation. He wants the conversations to flow. And so he'll rapid fire questions and badger people rather than letting there be silence or some pause <laughs> in a conversation. Uh, he becomes obsessed with uh, balding and aging and time. And uh, it feels like he's str really struggling to, to find uh, his place in, in his home. His, he comes from a very unhappy home. So everything's boring. Everything's very bland. Um, he has a community. He goes out and sees people every, every day as a means of just getting out of his home. But there's, there's just, things are not clicking. There's a, he's, things are lacking in his life in terms of his emotional responses to them. It feels like he's deadened, depressive, um, not, uh, yeah, there's something existential crisis-y like in his, the way he approaches the world. And my understanding from Leo is that there was, this was a huge, huge success, uh, a la uh, Catcher in the Rye and Holden Caulfield. Very similar in that uh, young people really relate to because he's, he says the types of things they wish they could say. He acts the way that uh, they wish they could act. But um, but as an adult reading it, uh, it I didn't get a, a lot from it. Uh, he drove me crazy, didn't like him. I can see its place in history at coming out of World War II in places in, in the literary canon of, of books reacting to uh, that so an example would be Camus the Stranger, uh, and so yeah, I I'm glad I read it. 
won't read it again. Thank you, Leo, for talking me through all of it and giving me all of the backstory, which was really, really interesting. Uh, my understanding is so many people have read this in, in, in the Netherlands. It's kind of like a, a mainstay. So next up, I've been scouring people's best of lists. So while I don't do them, I'm definitely benefiting from other people doing them at this time of year. Mine will be more like February. But I kept seeing this come up. And so I put, started putting holds on things and a hold for this audiobook came up and I jumped on it. The book is They're Going to Love You by Meg Howery. And this is really set in the New York City ballet community and uh, kind of starts off in the 80s. There's dual timelines. There's a current, current contemporary timeline and then there's an earlier timeline. And we have Carlisle, who's a dancer, and she comes from a family of dancers and ballet and dance has been in her, in her blood, in her family, uh, and is a very important piece of her life. Her mother and father divorced when she was young and her father has since come out as gay and has a partner that he is kind of obsessively in love with. Uh, she also really gravitates towards James and, and uh, her father's partner and he's the most accessible to her because her mother has since moved on She's since remarried, has a new family and children, and has left the, the dancing world behind and become a physical therapist. And, and the things that Carlisle, our main character, really cares about are the things about, about ballet and trying to win the approval of her father. And so we have these, these snatches of of moments where she's she's at their New York City apartment uh, and she's just waiting to be seen and recognized and valued and supported and talked to. But she's kind of, it feels like maybe her father looks at her as an accessory. And he has his own things going on. He is, this is the 80s and he's dealing with all of their friends dying of AIDS and their fears for their own, their own health and their own safety. Uh, and so that's, it ends up being a very confusing teenage years for Carla. Uh, we have a, then a new timeline, a current contemporary timeline where her father is dying. And it turns out there has been a significant 14 year gap when the father has spoken to her because there was a rift there was a, something happened that the father stopped speaking with her and what she's done in, since then. And so at that point, it starts to play, play back what, what that situation was. Um, I liked this book. I didn't love it. This won't be in my <laughs> preview, won't be in my top reads. Uh, I, I liked it very much. I thought the relationships were were well well said but i the character of carlisle i didn't really believe in her uh there was a sense to me that she just never that she was stilted and i you know you meet people who are stilted uh in terms of their maturity you know for example the the book i just mentioned the evenings but this was a sense of she was way more out in the world way more active in the world but there was a naivete and an innoc an innocence um, that just stretched credulity for me. Uh, I did believe the, the, the break, uh, that made sense. I, I could see that, but there were other things in, in, um, in her that I, I just didn't connect with. And so with that said, um, although I really liked, I did like the book, I didn't love it. Then let's talk about a book I did love. This was also a NetGalley arc that I received. This is Young Bloomsbury, the generation that redefined love, freedom, and self-expression in the 1920s England. And this is written by Nino Strachey. Nino Strachey is uh, related to one of the main characters uh, talked about, one of the main authors talked about in this book. And her, and her relation was Light and Strachey, very famous Bloomsbury crowd. 
and this book really did a great job at talking about the second generation Bloomsbury. So there's this, this internal conflict between the bright young things Bloomsbury group, Bloomsbury group, and the kind of old guard Bloomsbury, kind of more staid, Virginia Woolf, Light and Strachey, E.M. Forster, and then this new group that was that was really pushing the boundaries. And, and many of those boundaries were with gender, gender expression, and sexuality. Uh, I, I thought this book was so insightful. I'm actually gonna go out and get myself a copy because I liked it that much. The structure of how it was set up was, I thought, really effective because we're trying, we're really talking about a big group of people here. And so it was well structured so that we didn't have to meet every single individual first before we can understand the collective. Uh, I thought it was incredibly well done. If you are interested in uh, this time period, Virginia Woolf, E.M. Forster, this, just for those two um, pieces of information and, and insights into them, it's worth it. And then all the other things that you, you learn about all these other people was fantastic. So it's another great addition to the kind of um, nonfiction literary canon for, of London of the last century. But now I need to share with you that I ended the year with a five star read. I was starting to get a little manic about my numbers, which is so stupid because I read so much. I doesn't, it literally does not matter, but I am very goal driven. I am uh, someone who likes to set a target and I, and I like to achieve um, for myself. So I had to let go of the numbers and just say, I'm not gonna hit it and just enjoy myself for the rest of the day. And I grabbed this because it was also on so many lists and I've never read anything by this author, though I've heard amazing things. Uh, this is The English Understand Wool by Helen DeWitt. And this is this gorgeous copy that I got. This is a storybook by, I think it's New Directions. Let me double check. This is by Storybook ND. Yes, so it's a, a offshoot of New Directions. Uh, <laughs> this blew my mind. This short story, again, now you see why I'm saying short stories might be something I'm, I'm going to need to explore a little more next year, and I will with the Shirley Hazard Project. Check out my video about that. That's going to start in February. It's a deep dive into her work. But this one, <laughs> coming back. I can't even tell you too much about this story because it, it goes in so many different ways. It's like an onion that just reveals more and more and more until you're at the core. And I was astounded at the pace, the tone, the, the utter control of craft that Helen DeWitt has in putting this together. Um, we have a young 17 year old girl who is raised uh, with the best of everything. And her mother really feels like she's instructing her, has instructed her on the best life, the luxurious life, and, and how to set it up so that, she, so that she's successful in living this life. Uh, I'm gonna stop there and let you explore this on your own because it was five stars. I'm gonna come back to it because I wanna understand how she did it. It was that good. Okay, I can't believe I talked that much. And that's just about the books that I've read. Okay, let's talk about what I'm in motion with. So as today is New Year's Day, uh, I have a tradition, you may have heard of it. <laughs> and that is I read my favorite book, 84 Charing Cross Road by Helene Humph, every New Year's Day. And the past few years, I've been reading the French edition. Uh, this is my special copy given to me by my dear friend, Ron. And it is... It is actually signed by Helene Hoff, and it says, uh, Greetings to a Book Lover by Helene Hoff. Uh, so this is going on. I haven't started it yet. I'll do this after I get done filming, and I'll edit later tonight. But I'm going to be reading French for the third year in a row, and I really am hoping to see significant progress because I've been doing tutoring uh, lessons all year, and we actually went to Paris for a week 
this last year. So I'm hoping that I can see some significant improvement. Then I'm reading two books that I'm so deeply in love with. I can't, it, it, it hurts me to close my eyes. Uh, the first is Babel by R.F. Kwan. I don't know that I would have picked this up if I hadn't seen it on so many people's lists because I'm not necessarily a fantasy reader, uh, though I have admiration and when it hits right, it's perfect. Uh, but a lot of times it's, uh, it, 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 it doesn't gel with me, but this is hitting perfectly. I'm only a quarter of the way through and I'm reading it with Leo of uh, Leo's Little Book Life. We, and the reason I'm doing that is because there's so many things that he and I both share about the themes of this book. First off, it's fantasy and that's his genre. So my, so when we don't read together, he go, jumps to fantasy, I jump to mysteries usually. This is as a fantasy novel, I thought this would be great for our first buddy re, fantasy buddy read. Uh, it's set in Oxford, uh, it's historical fiction and it deals with language, uh, hence Babel. Uh, language uh, helps to, to propel a magic system. Um, and it also deals with colonialism. I'm, I'm absolutely astounded at how immediately I was pulled into this book, how I, I literally kick and scream if I have to close my eyes and go to sleep. I just want to rush through it. Uh, but I also want to savor it at the same time. So blown away. I cannot wait to get back to this book later on today. And that's a book of the month club, as is this one is a book of the month club choice. And I was telling someone, I think it was on Litzy, that I really, looking back, I was really disappointed with book of the month club this year. And it dawned on me that I don't think it's because of the offerings. I think it's because the covers were so crappy. They're so sub, uh, they were not interesting. They were visually uh, cookie cutter, uh, flat without depth, nothing that pulled me in. Uh, but here's another book of the month club pick for this year. This is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. This also shockingly is pulling me in. Uh, it's about the creation of video games and gamer culture and all that, which I was like, I don't care about. <laughs> Literally don't play video games. They make my heart race. I get really anxious. So I don't play video games. And yet, this is so compelling because it's not about vi video games as the backdrop. Uh, it's really about uh, relationships and these characters are fantastic. The dynamics between them is fantastic. Uh, they f everything feels real. Her writing is exquisite. It's so clear. It's so present, so, so compelling. So really also excited about that. Then I opened up, it's closed now, so apologies if you missed it, but um, I led a group read of the Balkan Trilogy last year and wanted to continue because there's, it's called the Fortunes of War Saga, and the next three is the Levant Trilogy. And so this is um, historical fiction that is set right as World War II is, is is coming out and um, is, is moving through Europe and the world. And so we have our two main characters, which are, which is a, a professor and his young wife. Uh, they were newlyweds, met in, in England and moved to Romania, and then had fled Romania in the Balkan trilogy. Uh, and so they are moving on from there. And we're, well, I opened up the group this morning and we will be having our first check-in next week. So I need to read this this week. Then I also have some other books I need to read. And this is for my In Real Life book club. Uh, so we're going to be meeting soon. And so I need to get on the ball and read The Trees by Percival Everett, which also appearing on so many best of lists for this last year. And then also this gorgeous little cover, Three Summers by Margarita Liberki. And this is, let's see, is it? Translated, translated from the Greek by Karen Van Dyke. Really lovely, lovely cover. This is a Penguin Euro European Writers uh, edition. Then I have, I want to read, I want to immediately get started on this. 
see what I mean when I say I'm book drunk? Uh, I am going to be starting my project. This is going to be a two-year project, and this is reading Emile Zola's uh, Les Rougon Macor uh, series, and this is The Fortunes of the Rougon uh, by Emile Zola. Now, I'm going to be reading Emile Zola in his... He, he later said that he wished they had been published in a different order. And so I'm reading his preferred order, not necessarily publication order. So he has this being the first book. I think so does the normal normal uh, publication run. So this is what I want to start this week. Then I have a whole nother grouping of books that I really want to get to in January. Uh, but this video has gone on long enough. So I'm going to stop it right here. And I'm going to start filming my Anita Bruckner, How and Why to Read Her. Okay, so that's it for me for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll look forward to talking to you soon and happy new year. Bye.